so I'm going to talk about recognizing non-formal learning. Um, so what we're doing now is what? Formal learning. Formal learning. So now with that and the internet, there's lots of ways we can learn things besides being in school. It used to be they had to come to school because that's where the experts were. That's where the people that knew what they are talking about, where you could talk with other people that were like-minded and, and everything. But now, there's lots of other options. So, like uncollege, um, MIT Open course, course, where we can actually go and see MIT lectures and see their course materials. Uh, Stanford Engineering everywhere. Uh, Harvard has the same kind of thing. Uh, Wikipedia, WikiCal, iTunes U. Lots of different places you can go to to get information, even just Google itself. If you want to find something out, my first thing is go to Google. See if I can find it there. Go to YouTube. See if I can find it there. Not necessarily, not necessarily okay, I need to wait until I can go to school to learn this thing. So Mark Twain said that I've never, never let school interfere with my education. So how many of you have have known people or experienced it yourself where you want to learn something but you have to wait until you get a couple more classes before you can take that class that you want to take. Or you already knew something but you had to take a class anyways. Anyone had to happen to? I had to take two computer classes even though I've been using computers since I was four. And so just kind of why? I have a student right now that he's in my basic level drafting class and he started using the CAD program in, in a different level class and watching the videos and stuff and he, by week three of the semester he was further along than what the, the actual class was going to do by week nine. And then he came to me a couple weeks ago and said, okay, I want to sign up for that class next semester. I said, why? You've already done 90% of it. If you do these two other things, but you can challenge it. I'll let, you, I'll let you into the next level class. Why take it if you already know it? He had no idea he could even do that. <clears throat> so, what, what is, so what? Right, that's the, the question. So, the, the recognized way for learning is the formal system in higher ed. In K-12, what's another option besides the formals? If you're in K-12, what, what, what if you don't want to go to a public school or private school? What can you do? Homeschool, Home school, right? You can set your own goals and you have to, you have kind of some things you have to do, but if you're, it's you're up to you to figure out how you want to do it. So why can't we do the same thing for higher ed? <clears throat> so, the formal system isn't for everybody. We've had a lot of talks about people that aren't ready for college, um, they're not meeting the standards, but what about those of us that, that are? That, that are exceeding the standards, that are not being challenged in the, the regular system. Or we don't want to stay at one thing. So who are some people that haven't gone to college or haven't finished college? Just some, some recent people in the last 20 years. None of these people finished college. Uh, Joichi Itu, Itu um, at the MIT Media Lab, he never went to college at all. And now he runs the Media Lab at MIT where they do groundbreaking research and development of high-tech tools at MIT. No college experience himself. <coughs> um, who, who, who in history has done great things without a college degree? Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln, the Wright brothers. No college. So why does it now that it's a requirement that we have to have college? I'm sure you've Maybe met some people that they're really good at what they do, but no college, call them back. So what makes that paper the magic thing? So the day I got my bachelor's degree, took the paper, 20% raise. I didn't know anything else that one day than I did the day before. But just because I had that piece of paper, they, they saw that as, okay, now you're recognized. So the problem here is, why <clears throat> can we do it other ways? And save some time, save some money, and not to be fixed that rigid structure that someone at a college or university has decided that you need to take these classes in this order in order to be recognized as having these skills. <coughs> so the way I did it, oh. so there's formal learning, there's non-formal learning, which is it's guided learning. You're going out, 
You're, you have a plan for what you want to do, what you want to learn, and you address it. So like my student, he's doing non-formal learning. He has a plan, he wants to learn AutoCAD, he's going to find videos, he's doing it himself, he's guiding himself, that's non-formal learning. There's also informal learning, which a lot of people kind of tie the two together. And I actually thought it was informal learning until I started doing research and then found it was actually non-formal. But informal is the stuff you learn just kind of by coincidence. Um, so I was trying, supposed to be doing this presentation, and I was looking on some TED videos on YouTube, and I saw a video about a brain scientist describing how it felt to have a stroke that, that she actually had. And so how the stroke felt from the inside of her brain and how her brain was talking to itself in the middle of a stroke. And so I learned a lot on that, but I didn't mean to do that. I just happened upon that video and watched it. And it gave me other insight into some other things. So that's informal learning. It's not planned, it just kind of happens. <clears throat> So the way I broke up my paper, because I couldn't find a lot of research in any one area, and it's kind of been revitalized in the, the new topics, there's not, nothing on. And so I went back and looked at government mandates and practices, um, uh, internationally and in the U.S. I looked at portfolios, which are a part of um, recognition of uh, non formal learning. I uh, looked at peer evaluations, what the research said about how valid they are. And then I looked at the open badge framework um, that's currently under work. It was actually announced, um, I'll get to that later. <clears throat> so the current practices, um, I forgot who was it that, someone mentioned that um, a lot of stuff for going to college started after World War II, the vets. That's also when recognition of prior learning started. That's the name of it, recognition of prior learning is one term, um, recognition of non-formal learning, but it started with the vets after World War II. They wanted some way to, to take that experience they had in the military and turn them into something they could use in college. Um, so they didn't have to retake stuff that they already done in the military. So we kind of did that. We made the, the AP test, we made CLEP to try and get some of that experience that you already knew from somewhere else and be able to use that as credit in college. Um, in 2000, the European Union, uh, European Union did the memorandum of lifelong learning, um, <clears throat> where they set a bunch of goals that you should be able to recognize any learning you do for use um, in getting a job or, or, or for college or whatever. So they, anything you do should be recognized, not just, oh, you didn't do that in school, so it doesn't count. <clears throat> um, so the UK came with it, the National Qualification, Qualification Framework, the Qualification Credit Framework, and the National Vocational Qualifications. And they kind of work together. And so this is the post, or this is kind of the education system. So this is oh. um, getting out of of the lower, ed, lower grades. And then here you have all your higher education that's incorporated in college, so levels four, five, six, seven, and eight. Um, so level six is a bachelor's degree, level, level seven is a master's, level eight is a doctorate. And in here is the national qualification framework. And so based on different levels of tests that are based on um, actual portfolios and observation of the skills, you can gain credit anywhere from level one all the way to level eight. So if you have experience that's commensurate with someone that's doing a doctorate, you can go in, submit an application for it, get evaluated, and gain credit for those. Um, and so if you have one to 12 credits, you get an award. Uh, 13 to 36, you get a certificate. And over 37 credits, you can get a degree. And you can do it all out of non-formal learning or you can mix and match. So you can do some things with credit for non-formal, some things through formal systems, and kind of mix and match and make it your own. So you're not tied to just doing everything through the formal system. France has the VAP and VAE. Um, not going to try and pronounce it. It's, uh, it's basically, it's, uh, Credit for, for professional experience, 
and just credit for experience in general. The VAP you need five years in a professional setting um, before you can apply for it. The VA you need three years of, um, of work on it. Uh, so, um, so portfolios mainly used. There's the recognition and the acknowledgement portfolios. Um, recognition is kind of for yourself. Acknowledgement is what you'd submit for credit. Um, what I found with peer evaluation was that in the research I read was all kind of uh, uh, in, in through college. It's all people that are learning it while they're trying to evaluate it. Um, and there's problems with inter -rater, inter -rater reliability. And everyone kind of rated people towards the middle. Whatever the mean was, all those scores were more towards the mean than what the instructor would rate. The instructor would have some outliers. Peer evaluations were all kind of right in the middle. Um, so uh, the Open Badge Framework is to my Mozilla, and it's being worked on with um, help from 4-H, Microsoft, Intel, NASA, Department of Ed, Department of Energy, Department of Labor, uh, VA, Time Warner, Motorola. These are all corporations and, and agencies that are involved with this, this uh, badge framework, trying to find a way to, that they can recognize non formal learning across lots of different areas. Um, so further research is, is peer evaluation and open learning where the people doing the evaluation are experts, or they could be experts. Um, is, that, is that okay? Is, how's the reliability with that? Um, what about how are employers going to accept badges? Would they accept it like they would a degree? Um, and then if you're having badges from different places, um, from either formal institutions or training centers or uh, pure um, Uh, like crowdsource or um, things like uh, like peer to peer university or something like that, where pe other people evaluate what you've done and decide if you should get the badge or not. Are those equivalent? Um, and also, I was thinking about it. Um, some other things would be to relate the reliability here back with what's the reliability with peer review for scholarly work. I couldn't find any research on that either. Um, so that would be something to tie in also. Um, so. Any Thank you, questions? James. <laughs> yeah. So oh, did you see any bridge between, let's say, industry certifications like Cisco certifications and Red Hat certifications? There was nothing like that in the research. And as they applied it, because that would be really interesting. Yeah, and part of the, the Mozilla Badge Framework is making it so that those would tie in with badges. Mm -hmm. um, and part of the framework is that it would be one place, so the badge wouldn't just be a picture. Mm -hmm. It would actually be something that's tied back to a database. And so that picture would have, you'd click on it, you'd be able to go back in and see who the issuer, issuer was, what was used as the, the proof of that. So mm -hmm. if you turn in a portfolio or a project in order to, as part of that badge, you could actually see the work that was done. Um, and so they, that could be tied in with industry certifications. Um, but there isn't any research on it yet. It's just a lot of my sources were primary sources. I actually went and read the, the government documents and I read the, the white papers from Mozilla and things like that. And then with the, the government things, the only one of them had a study that actually had empirical ev evidence. And that was the one from South Africa that I didn't get to. Um, and it had four subjects. So really no, no empirical research that I could find. So is there, is there much more flexibility with the acceptance of these alternate, uh, alternative uh, learning modalities outside of the United States? Yeah, um, that's what I saw from a lot. Like the one in, in the UK, it's big. And I found a couple empirical studies on that, but I wasn't able to get the full text in time. Mm -hmm. I'm still waiting on it. It's been a month. Um, <clears throat> so I want to see what those say and see how it actually is implemented because as the chart showed, it sounds really good that you can get credit in things all over the place and through different providers, just kind of like how the, the badge framework would be, but they're all kind of organized places. Um, and, and so I, I want to see how that's actually being implemented. 
because I saw some other things on South Africa, the titles were why the, the national qualification <laughs> framework in South Africa fail. Oh. But it was published the same year as the one that I read that said it's doing great. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what's going on. Well, that's just interesting in light of the fact that the universities are going to be, or they are, actively recruiting students from other countries. And because those students don't have access to um, higher education, but they, but my understanding is it's a, it's still a very traditional <coughs> higher education. Yeah. It's and, not and, badges. And, yeah, and the, and the one in Scotland, Scotland doesn't have any national um, guidelines, but the universities themselves, especially the newer universities that have been founded in the last 20 or 30 years, they've gotten together and made their own kind of framework on how they're going to accept uh, non-formal learning. So they'll actually have people come in and they'll work with them to, to form a portfolio that, that they can show what they know. And then they'll give them credit based on that, uh, either for, for courses or for even up to a full degree. And that would be to an, a potential employer. Yeah, and that actual university will give them credit for that. Oh, the university, yeah. and then they get the degree based yeah, on Yeah, and then they the get the degree based on just... So they can get full degrees based on just non-formal things. Gotcha. Okay. Where here, and at the, the JC level, you're limited to 15 units, either AP or CLEP or accredited by exams. Uh -huh. And at the CSUs, you're limited to 30 units, um, which is half, half a degree, mm -hmm. if you had mm -hmm. all those different things, which most people don't know. Has anyone here done accredited by exam? So. The room. I challenged us. We had, th we had three out of the, the class that have done credit by exam. For one class, two. It was one. One class, one. So I did I did credit by exam for one class, computer class, when I was at the JC. When I came here, I had to redo the class. Oh, wow. oh really? Um, I came here with three associates in drafting, and I had to take the basic AutoCAD class. Um, I'd, I'd been working in industry for three years, lots of experience. Walked in, get show my teacher a portfolio. Said, "Can I not do this?" And she said, "You want to teach a week?" I said, "Okay." How about I teach this? Yeah, I don't know that. I'll come back and teach that. And so it's like, why am I making? Why do I have to take this class? And so I know there's a lot of other people like that too. That it's kind of this class just wasting time, wasting money. I should do something else that that makes sense that will help me move on in my career. Thank you, James. Great presentation. Interesting subject.